Sally, are we good to go? I would wait 10 more seconds and I'm waiting to see if I get a cue. They told us we have to wait about 30 seconds. So um. All right, uh, President Schussel, I think you could proceed. All right, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. I, I'd like to call uh, this uh, Board of Regents meeting to order. Uh, welcome to our virtual May Board of Regents meeting. Uh, we're scheduled to be on our Dearborn campus this month, and we look forward to returning there in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us online as we work to protect the health and safety uh, of our community while continuing to operate the university. Uh, before I begin, I want to express my sympathy to the thousands of Michiganders affected by the flooding in Midland and in nearby communities. The disaster comes at a time when residents were already experiencing major hardships from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our hearts go out to everyone in mid-Michigan facing this disaster. We're all remote today, so I'll call a roll of the regions one by one so they can be noted for the record and for those not able to see the screen. Uh, Regent Acker. He's shaking his head. Uh, I was muted. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, Regent Beam. Here, present. Thank you. Regent Bernstein. Present. Regent Brown. Present. Regent Diggs. She's smiling. She's smiling, uh, but she's muted. That's fine. Regent Illich. Hi, I'm present. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Regent Weiser. Okay, he is supposed to be calling in. We'll get him soon. And I know that Regent White is on assignment with the National Guard. Um, also joining us today are all of the university's executive officers. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Regents and everyone at our university, I'd like to begin by congratulating the U of M class of 2020 for their perseverance and dedication to their studies. Uh, this year's class graduated into an historic moment in, uh, for our world and an extremely challenging set of circumstances. In times of crisis, society places a premium on smart, well-educated, hardworking people making a Michigan degree more valuable than ever. I'd like to thank everyone in the U of M family who helped our graduates celebrate in recent weeks, the amazing performances and messages offered online from community members near and far made graduation special while demonstrating the wonderful power of our worldwide network. I also thank our university's faculty and staff whose hardworking commitment is also reflected in the success of our graduates. Go Blue. The value of a Michigan degree is directly related to the work we do to maintain the highest standards in education. I express my appreciation to the nearly 200 individuals from the Ann Arbor campus led by Rackham Dean Michael Solomon who were involved in the virtual site visit by the Higher Learning Commission's peer review team. This was one of the first all remote 10 year reviews ever conducted. We've completed the majority of the 2020 reaccreditation process with our campus demonstrating at each step of the way that Michigan excellence is tangible and perpetual. We will have more to share about the results in the months ahead. World-class faculty have always been a hallmark of the University of Michigan. Each May, we're proud to recommend faculty members for promotion and tenure. Today, the recommendations being put forward by Interim Provost Collins, Executive Vice President Rungi, and Chancellor Dutta and Chancellor Grasso highlight the faculty strength of our three campuses. The talent, commitment, and hard work of our faculty never cease to amaze me. Congratulations to all. Though we won't be hearing from them in person, there are several members of our academic community who are with us in new roles. Colleen Conway, professor of music education in our School of Music, Theater and Dance will serve as chair of the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs. 
Normally, this would be Amanda Kaplan's first meeting after being sworn in as CSG president. And we'd be meeting uh, Dearborn student government president, Mitchell Dobson Green, if the meeting were to taking place in person today. Uh, I note and welcome Regent Weiser who's joined the meeting. Uh, I congratulate University of Michigan faculty members, Susan Donarski and Luke Schaefer on their selection as prestigious Carnegie Fellows. Nationally, they're among 27 awardees this year for this honor, which recognizes high caliber scholarly research in humanities and social sciences that focuses on important enduring issues confronting society. Yale was the only other campus to have more than one fellow this year. Among their many accomplishments, Donarski led the development of our Hale Scholarship Program, which has tripled the number of applications and doubled enrollment for low-income students at U of M. Her research has helped lead to our Go Blue Guarantee. And Schaefer is the founding director of Poverty Solutions at U of M, growing the initiative in a few short years into a national model in partnership and public engagement. The U.S. Department of Education has issued new federal regulations on campus sexual misconduct, which must be implemented by August 14th. There's a lot of work to be done this summer to bring us into compliance with these new regulations. I would note that our early reading of the regulations includes big changes that affect employees and more subtle changes in the hearing model. For right, I have to unmute this now, okay? We had already altered our student process due to the ruling by the Sixth Circuit. As always, we'll follow the law when it comes to our implementation, but we'll do it in a way that respects our values, and we will share information as soon as we can. Interim Provost Collins earlier this year noted that a working group of professors from our three campuses was developing recommendations for revising two Regents bylaws. Bylaw 5.09, which describes procedures in cases of dismissal, demotion, or terminal appointment of certain faculty, and Bylaw 5.10, which covers severance pay for faculty dismissed under 5.09. The recommendations were shared with the community and feedback was sought. The final revisions are part of our agenda today. The process for how we consider the removal of tenure is one that cannot be taken lightly. Tenure is essential for the integrity of the academic enterprise. I again thank everyone who has helped us develop these revisions to make us a better university. The state of Michigan is one of the hardest hit in the nation by the COVID-19 pandemic and the University of Michigan has responded. Our health professionals are saving lives on the front lines of the pandemic in U of M hospitals and clinics. Our researchers are pioneering medical treatments for coronavirus infection and advising decision makers across the country on the social, economic, and public health impacts of the pandemic. U of M faculty members have conducted research and scholarship, including a survey of parents whose children are learning remotely, using the data from more than 15 million cell phone records to examine social distancing, and understanding preparedness in our state's nursing homes and much more. Our university was originally envisioned as a resource for the people of Michigan. And over the last several weeks, we've been proud to deliver on our mission amidst many challenges through education, research, and patient care, that is both innovative and responsive to the needs of our community. The University of Michigan will look very different in the months ahead than what we've been accustomed to, but I am optimistic about our future. The planning taking place at all levels of our university to adjust how we deliver on our mission is thorough and impressive. This includes our preparations for the fall as we hope to be able to deliver a public health informed fall semester with a mix of in-person and online instruction on our campuses. I'm happy to report that yesterday, we began the phased reopening of our research labs and studios so that our talented researchers and graduate students can get back to producing the important discoveries that help drive our progress as a society. Our future will continue to be determined 
by the outstanding talent and hard work of the many people who are devoted to our public mission, our faculty, our staff, our students, and our supporters, the Michigan family. That is why I'm optimistic. Thank you. Uh, we now proceed uh, on to our regular uh, business agenda. Um, the minutes and reports are on our website. Uh, other reports from the senior leadership team beyond what's in the agenda book begin with Executive Vice uh, President and Dean Marshall Rungi. Marshall, you're muted. Thank you, President Schlissel. As the state of Michigan begins to emerge from the peak of the coronavirus pandemic, and especially with the governor's recent announcement about permitting elective surgery and procedures, Michigan Medicine is preparing to accommodate additional capacity for non-COVID related care. There is a very important message that we are sharing with our community, and that is first, we are safe and we are open. Second, you can come to our hospitals and health centers, whether for emergency situations or regular appointments, knowing that we can safely accommodate your needs. Managing your chronic conditions in particular is very important, so please do not delay care. We have a three-pronged approach to building back volumes for our non-COVID care. First, we're re we are rebuilding confidence among our patients, families, and referring physicians through an extensive marketing campaign, alerting them to how we are open and we are safe. Second, we have been and will continue to promote our virtual care offerings. We saw a dramatic increase in physician and patient utilization of virtual care, and we want to maintain those video and e-visits. And third, we're developing plans to rebuild growth in strategic services, identified as by our health system leadership as needs for our community. We're confident that these strategies will support the goals we have to continue to serve our community's health needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rangi. Uh, I next uh, call upon uh, the uh, Chancellor uh, Grasso for the Dearborn Campus Report. Thank you, uh, President Schlissel. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome you to Dearborn virtually, and my background is a, 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 a modest metaphor for our location virtually today. Um, I would like to note that on April 26th, we graduated our class uh, of students, uh, over 1,100 students virtually. It was in a, a, uh, a very nice ceremony uh, virtually, and uh, we uh, had 600 students that posted a profile voluntarily of themselves on our website. The, a week later, Ann Arbor graduated its class and we imported some of the great things that Ann Arbor had on their website, on our website as well, including the musical performances and the uh, address by Vice President Gore. And that all lives virtually on our website. I'd also like to note that last week we had a virtual town hall that was attended by over 500 individuals. And next week we're going to have a virtual town hall dedicated to our budget. Uh, again, to inform and interact with our faculty and staff. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm uh, the work and I'm very proud of our faculty and staff for adapting to our remote offerings this past semester. They did a terrific job. Some of them have gone beyond uh, just offering their work online and are studying the COVID crisis as either scholarship or through their uh, efforts uh, in, in the volunteer status. College of Business Professor Jun He created a survey to study people's willingness to wear uh, face masks as a precautionary measure, and he shared his results with the State of Michigan COVID response team on health and human services. Col the College of Engineering and Computer Science staff relocated some of their 3D printers to their homes so that they could uh, create uh, print uh, plastic head straps to help reduce strain from constantly wearing the N95 masks and, and uh, other PPEs from their home. And looking out for the elderly, College of Arts and Sciences, College of Arts, Sciences and Letters Professor Brenda Whitehead demonstrated the importance of the human element 
in the pandemic uh, as she's studying the impact on the elderly. And finally, Iota Sigma Pi, the National Honor Society for Women in Chemistry, has selected Dr. Sheila Smith, Associate Professor in the Department of Natural Sciences at, at Dearborn, to receive the Centennial Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Grasso. I next call upon uh, for the Flint Campus Report, Chancellor Dutta. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and good afternoon, board. Um, I also would like to congratulate our students who graduated in April, and we did a virtual ceremony for them. Everything went well. This is also an opportunity for me to thank uh, the faculty and staff who made these, the winter semester, the completion of, of winter semester possible. Uh, now on to updates. I would like to begin by thanking all my vice chancellors and all the deans who voluntarily took a pay cut and also additional 10 faculty and staff did the same. Everything was voluntary. So in total, approximately 80 individuals from our campus are either participating in furloughs or have taken the voluntary pay cuts. So I, I really express my gratitude to them because this is significant cost savings for the campus. Uh, with your anticipated approval, um, so later in this meeting, I am very excited that we will have at U of M Flint four new endowed professorships. Uh, they will bear the name of Myron and Margaret Weingarten professorships. This will recognize the tenured faculty, either associate or full professors who have demonstrated and will continue to achieve the highest levels of scholarship, teaching excellence and social impact. I am really very happy about this. ASME Student Engineering Award. As a mechanical engineer, I'm very happy to report to you that our mechanical engineering students received second place in a competition to create a drone, which was sponsored by the student chapter, the National Student Chapter of American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So congratulations to them and their faculty advisors. It's wonderful. And this is only their second time participating. So uh, as we approach the Memorial Day, I want to say to you that, that Michigan Veterans Affairs Agency has named U of M Flint a goal level school for the veteran students, fifth consecutive year. So we are very, happy about that and express our gratitude to all veterans for their service. And let me end with um, the information about shared governance. As you probably know, uh, we have launched a shared governance task force that will create over the summer a document that will then form the basis of shared governance at U of M Flint. They have begun their work last week, and I'm hoping to receive a, a document that will support the mission and promote the progress of this campus as a regional comprehensive university and part of this great University of Michigan. In early fall, I hope to recommend the bylaws to President Schlichel and to you for its ratification. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chancellor Dutta. Uh, we now move on to personnel actions. This is the month where we ask the board to approve uh, uh, promotions and tenure actions. Uh, I first call upon interim uh, Provost uh, Collins to discuss some of the uh, candidates being put forward from the Ann Arbor campus. Thank you very much, President Schlissel, and good afternoon, everybody. I'd first like to congratulate all of our University of Michigan graduates. Uh, congratulations. The university's commitment to excellence and diversity is borne out by our faculty in every field of inquiry, 
We have faculty who are conducting path-breaking research, are dedicated and effective teachers of the next generation, and who serve the society in critical ways. Each year, the review of promotion and tenure casebooks reaffirms our appreciation for the outstanding work of our faculty. This year, we are recommending 264 faculty members for promotion, including 157 instructional track faculty members, 93 clinical track faculty members, and 14 research track faculty members. Each case has been carefully reviewed at the department, school, provost, and presidential levels. And I present them to you with great pride in the accomplishments of the faculty who are being recommended for promotion. I am also very pleased to highlight the work of three faculty members, all of whom are recommended for promotion from assistant professor to associate professor with tenure. First, Professor Carrie Pratt is a faculty member in the Department of Chemistry in LSNA. Her research focuses on interaction between atmospheric trace gases, particles, and clouds, particularly in the Arctic, where rapid loss of sea ice and increasing shipping and development are affecting atmospheric composition. Dr. Pratt's work will aid our understanding of the chemistry of an environment that is experiencing rapid climate change. Dr. Pratt is a successful teacher who has developed an innovative undergraduate class that engages students in collecting data on snow chemistry. This hands-on project enables them to master key concepts in chemistry while developing lab skills. And she is also working with Detroit high school students, developing their interests in science. Second, Dr. Tawana Dillahunt is a faculty member at the School of Information. Her research is focused on how computing technologies impact group and individual behavior. She gives particular attention to the role of these technologies in underserved communities. Professor Dillahunt has received NSF support to help improve digital employment tools for underserved job seekers. And working in collaborative interdisciplinary groups, she helps to design, build, and enhance technologies that address real world problems. Professor Dillahunt's interest in problem solving has led her to develop and teach experiential courses that enable students to work with local communities in identifying technology needs and barriers to meeting them and then developing possible solutions. And third, Professor Seymour Spence is the faculty member in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the College of Engineering. Fascinated by tall buildings, he has focused his research on advancing our ability to predict and optimize the performance of structures that face severe natural hazards, such as hurricanes and tornadoes. Dr. Spence's work is helping to define a new generation of tall building systems that are optimal from both an environmental and reliability perspective. He is the recipient of two teaching awards and praised by his students at all levels for his passion and commitment to their learning. And he is also engaged in a new after school program to introduce high school students to civil engineering. And I now invite my colleagues from Michigan Medicine, Flint, and Dearborn to present additional outstanding faculty members. I believe Chancellor Dutta is next. You're mute. Uh, you're still muted, Deva. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it gives me great pleasure, Board of Regents, to to send to you. 14 applications for promotion and tenure from the University of Michigan Flint. Our faculty are highly committed to excellent teaching and scholarship and mentoring of students. Let me just give you two examples uh, that highlight this group. First is Professor Greg Lawrence, who is going from associate with tenure to full with tenure in the School of Management. The PNT committee unanimously recommended him to the rank of full professor. He is an exemplary teacher, consistently averaging 4.5 on a scale of five on teaching and has won the school's outstanding teaching award in 2015 and 2016. Greg Lawrence is recognized nationally as a theory-driven scholar in organizational behavior 
He has multiple integrated streams of research, including workspace design and personalization, job crafting, workaholism, employee stress, and well being. We all can relate to workaholism, I suppose. He has published extensively in these areas. He has also received the School of Management's Wynn Cooper Faculty Excellence Award for overall excellence. And one more, if you allow me, Jill Witt, from Assistant Professor to Associate Professor with Tenure in the Department of Biology in College of Arts and Sciences. She also was recommended unanimously. She is an excellent teacher and regularly teaches introductory and upper division undergraduate courses as well as graduate courses. She has also taught a course in forest ecosystems for the University of Michigan's biological station in Pelston. She is a forest and wildlife ecologist whose cross-disciplinary work in non-invasive field methods and wildlife populations has been widely published. She has built a strong record in teaching and scholarship, and we firmly believe that she will continue to flourish as a faculty member at U of M Flint. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chancellor Dutta. Uh, Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, uh, President Schlissel. Uh, I too am uh, very proud to put forward the names of 15 individuals uh, for approval, for promotion, and or tenure. Uh, we are equally committed to excellence in research and teaching and service on our campus. And the two individuals that I would like to share with you are, are uh, very much uh, models of this, mo uh, of this approach. Uh, Amy Brainer, who is uh, an assistant professor being promoted to associate professor with tenure of women and gender studies. She is the coordinator of our, of our LGBTQ studies certificate program and holds a PhD in sociology from Illinois. She currently studies queer and trans individuals and couples as they navigate marriage based on immigration to the United States. Since joining University of Michigan Dearborn in 2014, she's authored multiple articles and chapters and her uh, monograph has gained high praise. Her book, Queer Kinship and Family Change in Taiwan, received the 2019 Ruth Benedict Prize from the Association of Queer Anthropology. Uh, in May 2019, Dr. Brainer was featured on NPR to discuss the legalization of same-sex marriage. Also, uh, Natalie Simpson, who is being promoted from assistant to associate professor with tenure, uh, she has a, a PhD in, behavior, uh, in health behavior and health education from University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and conducts research in community-based uh, work to document and address environmental health inequities. She's published in many peer-reviewed journals, including the American Journal of Public Health, Environmental Justice, Global Environmental Change, Health in Place, and Progress in Community Health Partnerships. She co-chairs the American Public Health Association Environmental Justice Subcommittee. And in 2017, uh, Dr. Sampson was the recipient of the APHA Rebecca Head Award honoring an outstanding emerging leader from, from the environmental health field working at the nexus of science, policy, and environmental justice. Dr. Sampson and Dr. Um, uh, Brainer are both vital to our community engagement, uh, to our community engagement with the community and shows a crucial role that U of M Dearborn plays in the future of Southeastern Michigan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Grasso. Uh, Executive Vice President Rungi. Thank you, President Schlissel. Uh, today, I'm delighted to highlight two of our most outstanding faculty put forward for promotion today. The first is Dr. Jacqueline uh, Jarris, who is a surgical oncologist and a researcher from our departments of surgery, biomedical engineering, and pathology. After completing her surgical residency at Northwestern University, Dr. Jarris also earned her PhD there in breast cancer biology. She then completed fellowship in breast surgical oncology at MD Anderson in 2006 and returned to Northwestern as faculty prior to coming to the University of Michigan. Her primary research focus has been the study of cellular change 
during breast cancer progression, the identification of new therapies for aggressive types of breast cancer, and to preserve fertility in younger patients. She continued that work initiated at Northwestern after joining the University of Michigan in 2014 as a clinician and scientist with a translational oncology program lab. She's internationally recognized as a leader in breast cancer research as demonstrated by her multiple grants from the NIH and funding from the Dr. Polly Chung Fellowship Endowment and the Society for Surgical Oncology. Additionally, I have put forward a, rec for, for a recommendation that Dr. Jarris be appointed as the Associate Dean for Regulatory Affairs. The second faculty member that I'm highlighting today is Dr. Maria Sandquist, who's a researcher in our Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Dr. Sandquist is a native of Sweden. She earned her PhD at the University of Umeå in Northern Sweden. She then completed postdoctoral studies at the University of Michigan and at NIH. After working at the American Red Cross and the University of Maryland School of Medicine, she returned to the University of Michigan in 2005 as an associate professor. Dr. Sandvitz's research focuses on protein secretions and how to manipulate the secretion process for preventive, therapeutic, and biotechnological use. Her work impact, impacts pathogens that are life-threatening and persistent in hospital settings and resistant to multiple drugs. She's also an excellent mentor and educator, having received the Basic Science Teaching Award in 2018. Dr. Sandvist is funded by multiple sources, including NIH and the Department of Defense. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rungi. Uh, personnel reports are in the materials. Uh, we have a, a large number of retirement memoirs, and I'd like to make a comment about one of them in particular. I want to extend my congratulations and best wishes to Paul Courant, who's amongst the faculty we're honoring today in the retirement memoirs. You can read about his outstanding service to U of M in the documents posted online, including his time as provost, interim provost, dean, director, chair, and Thurnau professor. In each role, he applied his knowledge as an economist and policy expert to advance the excellence of our university. This includes his work to develop our budget model and champion, championing diversity, equity, and inclusion. On a personal note, I wanna thank Paul for his leadership in stepping up to serve as interim provost in 2017. I appreciated his wise counsel and innovative thinking. It was also great fun working together. Paul also brought an incredible wit to his work. I finally remember a meeting a few years ago when he and I were discussing the macroeconomic value of public research universities. I asserted that while there's a clear economic impact generated by the dollars we spend on research, the larger return on investment must take into account the new knowledge and innovations developed by our faculty and the productivity of the graduates we produce. Without missing a beat, Paul proclaimed that I passed my first exam in economics. Thank you, Paul, for your outstanding service. Uh, Interim Provost Collins has additional acknowledgements to make as well on our retirees. Yes, thank you very much, President Schlissel. I would like to call um, your attention to the retirements of two faculty members. First, James Jackson is a path-breaking psychologist whose work focuses on racial and ethnic influences throughout people's lives. Dr. Jackson, who retires as a Daniel Katz Distinguished University Professor of Psychology, served as the director of ISR for a decade, a member of the National Academies of Science and the, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, he has led the university's world-renowned research program on Black Americans. Second, in 1976, Chris Whitman was the first woman to join the faculty of the law school. She holds an appointment in women's studies as well. A three-time Michigan alum, her research areas include federal courts, constitutional litigation, feminist jurisprudence, and questions of individual and institutional responsibility. The Francis A. Allen Collegiate Professor of Law, Professor Whitman has twice been honored with the L. Hart Wright Award for Teaching Excellence, and she also served as Vice Provost for Academic and Faculty Affairs. 
Thank you, uh, Provost It's Collins. my great pleasure to recognize both of them. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there is a memorial I'll call your attention to in the book, uh, but now I call for a vote on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Support. Uh, please unmute. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Thank you very much. The consent agenda carries. Now we move to the uh, regular agenda. Uh, finance and property, item number one, absolute return and alternative asset uh, commitments, Vice President Hegarty. Yes, Mr. President, I have nothing to add to the item as presented. It is informational only and does not require a vote of the board. Thank you. Item number two, planned uses of income from the Julian A. Wolfson and Marguerite Wolfson Endowment Funds for fiscal year 2021, Vice President Hegarty. Again, nothing to add to the description of the board materials. I simply ask if the board, uh, I recommend it for approval to the board. Thank you very much. Is there a motion? So moved. A second? second. All those Four. in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Thank you. Item number two carries. Item number three, the authorization to issue general revenue bonds, Vice President Hegarty. Yes, Mr. President, included in the materials provided to the board is a request to permit the university to issue up to $1 billion in long-term debt. While issuing debt in the public financial markets is routine for the university, the total request at $1 billion is substantially larger than historical transactions. This request is intended to take advantage of historically low interest rates and will be used principally to fund capital projects, to refinance higher cost existing outstanding debt, and in the event of a financial emergency, provide additional liquidity to the university. Our commitment to the board is to be fully accountable for the use of proceeds from this debt issuance. We will consult with the board prior to using any proceeds from this issuance for any purpose other than to refinance existing debt or to fund projects, capital projects approved by the board. Uh, the documents required to provide the necessary authorizations are included in the board materials and I ask it for the board's approval. Thank you, Vice President Hegarty. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Item three carries. Item four, Vice President Hegarty, issuance and sale of commercial paper. Yes, I'm requesting approval of the board to renew the university's commercial paper program with the same total limit of 300 million. The wording of the new program documents, however, have been modified to allow the university to use commercial paper as needed for general operating purposes. This modification is to provide the university additional financial flexibility if needed. Should the need arise for that purpose, we commit to discussing the use of commercial paper with the board prior to doing so. Uh, thank you, Vice President Hegarty. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Thank Support. You. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to the conflicts of interest agenda. Items 5 through 39 are conflict of interest items, each of which requires six votes for approval. The regents have carefully reviewed all of these items and will consider them together as a block in one vote unless any regent requests individual consideration of or recusal from voting on a particular item. Does anyone have any questions about a particular item? Would any regents like to request recusal from voting on any items? I now call for a vote on items five through 39. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Support. Uh, I need to do a roll call or show hands. So I'll do a roll call. Uh, uh, Regent Acker. Aye. Regent Dean. Uh, my hand's up. Aye. Oh, thank you, Mike. Regent Bernstein. Aye. I see, Mike, I see Mark's hand. Uh, uh, Regent Brown. Aye. Regent Diggs? Aye. Uh, Regent Illich? Approved. Regent Weiser? Aye. Thank you very much. The uh, conflict items uh, pass.
Uh, I now uh, turn things over to Vice President Churchill for um, uh, an initial item on the region bylaws. Thank you, President Schlissel. There are two um, sets of bylaw amendments in today's agenda book. Uh, the first one is item number one under other. <laughs> Uh, these bylaw revisions on the dismissal of tenured faculty members are the result of careful consideration by a working group of nine professors from all three U of M campuses. The group was charged with furthering the university's commitment to upholding tenure, addressing egregious situations deserving of expedited proceedings and interim measures, and reviewing and revising existing bylaw language. They include bylaw 509, which describes procedures in which, in cases of dismissal, demotion, or terminal appointment, and 510, which covers severance pay. Decisions regarding the dismissal of tenured faculty within a reasonable time frame while respecting the due process rights are beneficial to both the faculty member and the university. The amendments largely align with the recommendations of the working group and we again thank the committee for their significant work on these important issues. Uh, thank you. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Uh, uh, all those Support. in favor? Thank you. Support. Aye. Thank you. All, Aye. All, all, Aye. 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 Are you opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, the second item, Vice President Churchill. Yes, the second set of bylaws um, are revisions that include several changes to college and school executive committees and changes in degrees. They also include the formation of a new regent committee focused on the Flint and Dearborn campuses. Public comments on the new committee included a request for clarification on the shared governance language, which has been incorporated into the committee charge. And I understand Regent Beam will be the uh, inaugural chair of that committee. That's great. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. So, moved. Uh, so I heard two for it. Very good. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. The uh, motion carries. Um, there is an item in the book on the academic calendar for 2022-2023. Uh, is there a motion to approve the calendar? So moved. so moved. Okay, I'll take that as a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Thank you. The academic calendar carries. I'll now turn things over to Vice President Churchill for public comments. Thank you, President Schlissel and Regents. I'd like to remind each speaker that you have up to three minutes to address the board. Topics may require studying, study and analysis, so the president and regents will not necessarily respond to comments at today's meeting. I'll start with um, the first speaker, and each speaker will be unmuted and unmuted as we proceed. So thank you for uh, your indulgence in this new format. So I would like to ask our moderator to please activate the first speaker, Margaret Smith. Margaret, you have three minutes to speak. Hi, thank you very much for um, letting me speak. I'm Dr. Smith. I'm a sixth year general surgery resident um, at the University of Michigan and president of the Health Officer Association. As unions represent, representing healthcare workers at Michigan Medicine, the Health Officers Association, UM Professional Nurses Council, and the United Physicians Assistants of Michigan Medicine call on Michigan Medicine, excuse me, Michigan Medicine leadership and the University Administration to reverse the recently announced cuts to the compensation and benefits of non-union employees, as well as the announced cuts to union and non-union jobs. Now is not the time to be punishing healthcare workers who have made a commitment to serving the public good during the COVID-19 pandemic. We urge the University Administration to make a bold decision and use money from the UM endowment to cover losses incurred by the pandemic. We know that the endowments are not ordinarily used to cover operating expenses, such as salaries and benefits, but we right now are not living in ordinary times. During, during a global pandemic, the UM administration should not, excuse me, should be willing to make this decision instead of cutting the compensation and jobs of hard uh, working frontline healthcare workers. Enough liquid funds exist in the endowment for this purpose, and the action is warranted by the global crisis. It is wrong to maintain investment for the institution's future projects while cutting the retirement contributions of employees, their investments for their future. Now is the time to reward the work, commitment, and courage that healthcare workers have shown and will continue to show every day. 
With regard to the HOA's lack of a contract, as house officers have expressed at the bargaining table, we feel insulted by the administration's refusal to make a fair salary offer and resolve other basic issues. When Michigan Medicine says that a fair contract would require them to eliminate jobs, we must again point out that you have other options. Michigan Medicine is not traded on the stock exchange. Its purpose is not to make money for shareholders. The University of Michigan is a nonprofit public institution, and its hospital system's mission is to heal the public, train physicians to be lifelong learners, and produce excellent medical research. The administration's focus on balancing the books during a time of crisis is wrong. Besides the endowment, if you do not believe that makes long-term financial sense, you should get over the reluctance to borrow. Interest rates are incredibly low, as we've already heard today. The university's administration can access credit at extremely favorable terms and do right by their people. Asking our resident physicians to lock into a three-year contract that will not meet their needs is not the right position to take. House officers are there for our patients, and the administration needs to be there for house officers. And I appreciate you rearranging the order in order for me to speak first today as I am currently standing outside of the operating room where I unscrubbed um, in order to give these comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Regent Brown uh, wanted to make a comment in this context. Uh, Paul, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, thank, thanks again, Dr. Smith, for your words. Um, and thank you and your colleagues for, for risking your life every day for the people of the state of Michigan. Um, I wanted to, to do this publicly to call on the administration, administration to uh, complete the negotiations uh, by agreeing to a fair contract that recognizes the, the hard work uh, and value of the house officers so that, that they and you can return to the and put all your focus on the important uh, uh, of caring for the citizens of Michigan. Thank you, um, Regent Brown. Regent Diggs? Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank comments and for her you know, work as well as all, of her, as all of her colleagues over the last few months during the COVID crisis. You know, I, I really regret that, um, that there hasn't been more progress with the contract as a former, former house officer at the University of Michigan, a member of the HOA. Um, I know how important the association is. You know, during my time as a resident, frankly, I was really unable to focus as you have with your extraordinary on the things that I needed, the benefits that I had as the resident because I was so focused on the work I was doing every day. And I appreciated the fact that the HOA do, do things for me, like get a good disability plan, take care of friends, uh, think about salary. And so um, with, uh, with the residents, especially during this time, and I hope that we can come to in soon on just these, a couple of these issues. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Diggs. Uh, let's move on now, I believe, to the second speaker. Yes, uh, I'll ask our moderator to please activate our next speaker, Brianna Kruger. Brianna, you're welcome. Hello, my, my name is Brianna Kruger, and I am president of the One University Student Organization at U of M Dearborn. I'm speaking today to stress the importance of the asks highlighted in the Leaders at Best Without Exceptions proposal that has been written by members of the One University Coalition and has the overwhelming support of our allies. We are asking that the Go Blue Guarantee diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, expanded scholarships for study abroad, and medical and legal services be extended to both the Dearborn and Flint campuses. We understand deeply that the university will suffer economic hardship in forthcoming months amid the COVID-19 crisis. However, this crisis has exacerbated the inequity and lack of support that students, faculty, and staff face on Dearborn and Flint campuses. Enrollment and retention will undoubtedly suffer, and students in the state of Michigan will be in even greater need of financial stability and support. Students of color and first-gen students face additional systemic barriers that require a dedicated and consistent effort to support and retain underrepresented students. The importance of extending the Go Blue Guarantee to all campuses cannot be stressed enough. Many of my friends and I have had the opportunity to attend the University of Michigan Ann Arbor under the Go Blue Guarantee, but chose to go to the University of Michigan Dearborn at a higher cost out of pocket in order to be present in our communities and families at home. <laughs> Excuse me, at home. Furthermore, One University recommends providing Dearborn and Flint campuses with legal aid clinics via the staff at Ann Arbor Student Legal Services. Legal services have shown to improve long-term retention and sense of belonging for students. We also recommend 
We also recommended beginning partnerships on each campus with nearby hospitals to ensure that all students, including uninsured students, do not face out-of-pocket costs. Although U of M, Dearborn, and Flint students are permitted to access university health services through the Ann Arbor campus, they are required to pay out-of-pocket costs for all services they receive and travel to Ann Arbor. These combined costs can easily be more expensive than the fee that Ann Arbor students pay to access some of the same services. Now is the time, more than ever, to extend these services to all campuses, as many uninsured students work on the front lines of this pandemic and continue to suffer financially from the economic impact. These outlined solutions in the proposal offer a cost-effective means to increase enrollment, retention, and graduation rates, ultimately bringing a significant return on investment for the university. We understand that difficult decisions must be made in response to the pandemic, but this is an opportunity for the university to lead the state of Michigan on issues that affect students. I am proud to be a University of Michigan Dearborn student and choose to go to Dearborn because of the impact that students, faculty, and staff continue to make on me. I'm confident that I would not be the person that I am today without being a part of the U of, U of M Dearborn community. Being active on campus has shown me my responsibility to advocate for my underrepresented peers and stand up for what is just. I am asking you to reflect on the responsibility that you have to your students, faculty, and staff while running one of the wealthiest public institutions in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now activate our next speaker, Kelly Quinlan. Kelly, you may proceed. Hi. Hi, my name is Kelly Quinlan, and I have just finished my first year at the University of Michigan Dearborn. On our campus, I'm a member of the Political Science Association, Fine U Fraternity, Student Government, and One University. As a first year student, I made it my goal to be involved on campus and work hard to make any necessary improvements around the Dearborn campus. I'm excited to have been given the chance to speak to you all today because I love my school and my campus with my whole heart, but I know there are a lot of improvements that we can still be making. One issue I've seen a large struggle with on our campus is our study abroad program. When I was looking into working on the Ottawa internship that is offered to us, I was made aware by a professor that in past years, the way these spots have been split up hasn't quite been equal across all three of our campuses, and often we end up with a lot more Ann Arbor students than we do from Dearborn or Flint. I think that when it comes to our student, to our study abroad programs across the university, the more trips we offer, the better. If all three campuses are offering the same opportunities, then we are given the chance to increase enrollment at our satellite campuses because some students may be applying based solely on the study abroad opportunities that are being offered to them. I've also grown up with the belief that any, that any student that wants to take the opportunity to study abroad should be able to. The experience the person gains while traveling and being immersed in a culture different from their own cannot be matched in any classroom. Unfortunately, many students cannot take this opportunity, even if there are plenty of trips being offered because the cost is simply too high, especially on our campus that is home to a large number of non-traditional students with all kinds of backgrounds. If our campus was to be given more funding to put towards study abroad opportunities, the cost could drop significantly and open up a new world of possibilities for our students to experience. My number one reason for getting involved with One U at U of M Dearborn was because I believe that the idea of the Go Blue guarantee is a huge step for our university, but I have found it to be problematic that it is only offered on one of our three campuses. Generally speaking, our students at Dearborn and Flint come from lower income families from the beginning, and they would greatly benefit from having this type of scholarship available to them as well. A student should still be offered the same scholarship opportunity should they choose to go to Flint or Dearborn over Ann Arbor. As our Board of Regents, you all have a duty to make sure that all University of Michigan students are being afforded the same opportunities that make them the leaders and best, no matter where they choose to study. I personally have often found that we struggle to have a sense of cohesion and family across all three campuses, but I think that making sure these larger opportunities are offered to all University of Michigan students is a great place to start because at the end of the day, all students should be offered the same University of Michigan experience. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, our next speaker then will be Jared Eno. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Jerry Eno. I'm a doctoral student at uh, Ann Arbor. And I'm addressing you today as one of the more than 1,800 signatories to an open letter calling for the University of Michigan to support its graduate students through the COVID-19 pandemic. Graduate students are facing financial insecurity, delayed or halted research, a job market paralyzed by hiring freezes, caregiving duties, visa issues, and many other difficulties. 
The open letter provided concrete measures that the university could take to help graduate students address these challenges, not just graduate students, but also faculty, staff, alums, undergraduate, GEO, LEO, student organizations, and others all signed this open letter. Last Friday, UM sent a pro forma reply that did not respond in a substantive way to any of the issues raised in the letter. Letter signatories were simply told that, quote, many of the items you've suggested in your letter are not financially feasible, end quote. No effort was made to engage with the likely costs and benefits of the measures we called for, <clears throat> including the fact that some of our demands would not require significant expenditures. This contradicts the principle of transparency that President Schlissel committed to in his April 20th message. Unfortunately, this is part of a broader pattern. In the past week, the Huron Valley Area Labor Federation and nearly 600 signatories called on the university to open the books and share information about UM's finances. The petition asked for a response by this past Tuesday, May 19th, to no avail. We had to ask to be heard because the university has not included its own community in its decision-making process. For example, the provost committees on reopening campus have minimal graduate student representation, but the administration chose unilaterally. The university should use a participatory process to include graduate students on all committees to reopen campus, and the same goes for other workers. The university must work, co work collaboratively with its community if it is to make well-informed and equitable decisions about its future. UM is a huge and decentralized organization, and a full accounting with finances is surely complex, but the university can and should be transparent about this by sharing with its stakeholders what information it does and does not have, and explaining how it is using that information to make its decisions. UM has asked a lot of its community, and workers have stepped up, transitioning to online instruction, caring for the sick, and maintaining a safe environment. The least the university can do in return is to be open, honest, and collaborative in its decision making. Dozens of people personally emailed you in advance of this meeting, asking you to open the books, to provide a substantial response to the graduate student petition by tomorrow, and to make arrangements for a town hall meeting open to all graduate students next week. I join them in all of these demands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please activate our next speaker, Samuel Stolper. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm an economist and assistant professor at U of M School for Environment and Sustainability. I'm speaking to you today to urge you to prioritize carbon neutrality on an ambitious timeline and to suggest a general way to do so at low cost. Along with my colleague, Professor Michael Moore, I've been working for the past year to estimate the costs of various ways that the university could reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon neutrality means net zero emissions, as opposed to the zero gross emissions of purely local decarbonization. We know from climate science that the climate-related effects of emissions reduction don't depend on the location or source of the reduction. Thus, limits on the technical or financial feasibility of campus decarbonization do not constrain the university's ability to mitigate climate change, nor do they justify inaction. In fact, we can pursue non-local emissions reduction and campus decarbonization simultaneously so that one does not crowd out the other. The carbon neutrality goal allows the university to pursue emissions reduction projects wherever they are most attractive, whether on the grounds of cost effectiveness, environmental justice, or other relevant criteria. In our analysis, we focus specifically on costs because we believe the financial constraints faced by the university are ever present. And the coronavirus pandemic has tightened this constraint significantly, making cost effective climate action all the more important. Our analysis highlights three widely understood facts. One, the cost of renewable energy has fallen dramatically in recent years. Two, there are large economies of scale in renewable energy production. And three, the cost of renewables per unit emissions reduction vary widely across space, especially as a function of how much the sun is out and how much the wind is blowing. What this means is that strategically placed large scale renewable power installations are a very cost effective way to reduce emissions. U of M needs to pursue this avenue of emissions reduction seriously and immediately, especially to take advantage of federal renewable subsidies that are being rapidly phased out. Examples of this strategy among universities abound, from Stanford to Ohio State to American and George Washington. Our favorite example, though, is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. MIT posted a request for proposals for large-scale renewables all over the country. It received 41 such proposals in response, 
11 of which involve sites in New England. Ultimately, it chose to pay for the construction of a 60-megawatt solar farm in North Carolina in exchange for the rights to both the power, which it sells to recoup upfront costs, and the renewable energy credits, which it keeps in order to ensure that nobody else takes credit for the emissions reductions. The expected aggregate cost of this project was zero dollars. In sum, we think the best thing U of M can do is immediately post an RFP, a request for proposals for large-scale renewables in Michigan and beyond. Oh my God. Oh, so I thought my phone died, sorry. <laughs> we would be happy to share a report or talk further about our analysis at any time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're glad it didn't die. Yeah, um, good job. Yeah, <laughs> we were hanging on there with you. Okay, our next speaker is Brian Lent. Hello to the Regents and President Fischel. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity today to speak at this month's meeting. Uh, my name is Brian Lent, and I've been a PA at U of M for the past four and a half years, and I see myself staying here for many years to come. Uh, I'm proud to work at a world-renowned institution, and I firmly believe that the faculty, staff, and employees are what make U of M such an exceptional place to work. I'm humbled each day knowing that U of M employees make a positive difference in our community. I'm honored to speak today on behalf of the physician assistants at U of M Mich Michigan Medicine, uh, who have joined to form the United Physician Assistants of Michigan Medicine, or UPM for short. PAs at U of M and Michigan Medicine have noticed that an inequity exists at our institution. Our nurse practitioner counterparts, who serve in the same roles as PAs, see higher salaries, increased retirement saving contributions, additional lead pay, TTO sellback options, higher on-call pay, and higher redeployment wages. Over the years, it has been evident that bargain for employees at U of M see numerous benefits. With the recent announcement from Michigan Medicine, the disparity is worsening and PAs are, once again, uh, having raises and benefits removed. Because of this widening gap in the recurrent cuts, PAs have been working together for the past two years to create UPAM, which aims to represent, advocate, and serve as a democratic voice for its phys member physician assistants. As individuals, we have been unable to enact long-lasting policies that benefit our profession. Uh, through UPAM, though, our collective voice can be heard and positive changes can be made for PAs throughout the U of M community. UPAM is proud to announce that we have reached a clear majority of PA signatures in favor of a collective bargaining unit. This milestone was possible with the hard work of many PAs, as well as the staff and leadership of the AFT Michigan. The organizers and supporters of UPAM are therefore requesting that the regents recognize UPAM as an official union. Physician assistants have a history of providing quality and compassionate care to those in need. Through UPAM, we want to continue this trend as well as reduce the inequality that exists between PAs and their bargain for colleagues. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. And we, as the collective voice of UPAM, are excited to be a part of the University of Michigan's bright future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Bernstein wanted to make a comment. Mark? Thank you, President Schlissel. Brian, thanks so much for, for joining us today by Zoom. I also want to uh, give a shout out to Trina, Jesse, Jen, and Jermaine, our IT superstars who have uh, made all this happen. Sally, also, thank you. This is not an easy crew to uh, get onto, into, and, and maintain, and, and stay in a, a Zoom meeting. Um, I also, uh, with respect to the physician assistants, and Brian, I want to congratulate you on, on your, your successful two-year organizing effort. And I also want to say two things really briefly. One is just to reiterate what I said uh, back at our most recent meeting in March is that, you know, I fully support the adoption of policies that will formally recognize union representation of the physician assistants uh, in uh, this summer, uh, no later than hopefully in July. Also, secondly, and I think really importantly, uh, given the fact that the PAs have, in my opinion, you know, essentially cross the finish line on this, I'd strongly oppose any uh, unilateral extraordinary changes to their ter to your terms of employment with pay or, or work conditions and the like. Um, but, but most importantly, thank, congratulations on the work of organizing under extraordinarily challenging and, and difficult circumstances. Um, um, I'm, I'm enormously grateful to you and to your colleagues uh, for, the, for, for your work and, and looking forward to, 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 for many, to, to working together many years to come. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, back to you, Sally. Our next speaker is David Dumas. 
Good afternoon. My name is David James Dumay. I am a physician assistant in the emergency department in ICU at Michigan Medicine. I'm coming to you today as a strong advocate and member of the United Physician Assistants of Michigan Medicine, also known as UPAM. And I ask you to recognize us as the collective bargaining group for PAs at Michigan Medicine. I've been with this university over the past half of a decade, and I'm proud to work at Michigan Medicine, given the abundance of resources readily available to provide expert level and accessible care to all patients. Over the past several months, myself and my team have watched the unthinkable happen as a global pandemic has wreaked havoc on our world and our own healthcare system. We have watched human beings fearful to come to the emergency department with specific examples of a man with chest pain who subsequently developed lifelong complications from a heart attack that he suffered while at home. I've personally taken care of a woman who is now permanently blind as she did not seek medical care for her stroke. We have watched people die alone of COVID-19 with no family or friends at bedside, only the mere strangers of their care team who attempted to fill such an incredibly hollow void. We've made so many phone calls to loved ones in the past four months to try and ensure that they are apprised of the state of their loved one's illness as they cannot be at their bedside. We have come to work as frontline providers and have done our duty, and more than ever followed an oath that we took so long ago. We have taken care of humans and provided humanity during, during this incredibly difficult and uncertain time. The healthcare system has made drastic decisions to cut 401k match, continuing medical education funds, potential cost of living adjustments, and worst of all, the humans that have showed up to help our patients. Last week, we were informed that we must cut 10% additional funds from our ER budget, and myself and my 34 ERPA colleagues have banded together to decrease all of our hours and potentially take additional salary cuts as we refuse to cut colleagues with less seniority. People that have served together for a greater cause in an unprecedented time and people that I am proud to say continue to put the needs of others over the needs of their own. We are coming to you today to be recognized as a collective bargaining group of PAs at Michigan Medicine. In forming this union, our goal is to form a unified body of individuals that have the ability to work with the university in a dynamic relationship. We want to continue to provide safe, accessible, quality care and navigate with both the healthcare and university leadership and methodologies in which we can fulfill the shared goal. My hope for all of us is that you recognize UPAM so that PAs can represent themselves and subsequently help us all fulfill our potential needs to meet the human. Thank you for your time and your potential recognition. Uh, thank you. I understand that uh, Regent Acker would like to make a comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I just want to take a, a brief moment to thank you and congratulate uh, all the PAs uh, on coming together to form this collective bargaining unit. Uh, as someone who has PAs in their family, I know how hard you work for patients. I know how hard you've been working for patients throughout this horrific pandemic. And I just want to congratulate you. Like Regent Bernstein said, over the last two years, putting this together has been an incredible accomplishment. So congratulations. Okay. Our next speaker is Elena Sabrino. Hello. Thank you. My name is Elena Sabrino. And I'm a Flint alumna calling today to ask the regions to take actions to create more equitable learning environments at the Flint and Dearborn campuses. I graduated from U of M Flint in 2015. I was a Maize and Blue Scholar and I got a dual degree in music and anthropology. I'm currently a PhD candidate at MIT in the Science, Technology and Society program. I really want to emphasize that my path to MIT was made possible by the teaching and mentorship and programs and financial support I had access to at U of M Flint. When I began college, I had no expectation of going to grad school. This was something that didn't even register in my mind at first as a possibility. So when I reflect on how I got to where I am today, these are the things I want the regents to know. I received the Michigan Scholar Award, which covered four years of full tuition. This made it possible for me to graduate with no student debt. I got travel funds from the honors program that allowed me to study abroad in the United Kingdom the summer between my junior and senior year. In my senior year, I collaborated with the Women's Education Center to do research for the first time as an undergraduate. I needed these funding opportunities to successfully graduate, and I needed the strong community I found on campus to support my intellectual curiosity and to build my personal confidence. I know firsthand that an education at U of M Flint can be transformative, but I also know that I couldn't have gone on to a highly competitive PhD program at MIT if I had had to deal with the financial pressures of debt accumulation. And my academic transcripts were strong because I didn't face the same stress and delays that I saw many of my friends face when they had to balance work with study. 
We all know that there's a lot of work to do to make sure the resources that made such a difference for me are available to every single student without exception. Flint student body, as detailed in the report submitted by the One University campaign, is predominantly made up of working class students and students of color. I urge the University of Michigan to act on their stated commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion by extending the Go Blue guarantee to the Flint and Dearborn campuses. I join my voice with the One University campaign to call for immediate relief measures for Flint, a city that's disproportionately impacted by the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. And in addition to an immediate response to the pandemic, Flint needs you to take action on the carefully researched longer term measures that are outlined in the report that was submitted to you. I know from the most personal experiences that U of M Flint has outstanding faculty, lecturers, staff, and students, and they all deserve your full support today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, our next speaker is Douglas Farr. Good afternoon. Um, I'm honored to have this opportunity to address the Regents. I'm a, a proud 1980 graduate of the Taubman School of Architecture. I am a, an art practicing architect and president of my own architectural firm, Far Associates in Chicago, and we focus on high performance buildings. And I wanted to commend President Schlissel's pledge to make the university carbon neutral as a proud alum this just warms my heart um, and i wanted to share the recommendations and the comments i wanted to make today pertain to something the university will have to do to fulfill president schlissel's commitment and that is to make a project by project commitment that when new buildings are built or buildings are renovated that they they adopt a deep energy retrofit approach and that they they are um, all electric buildings that is to say they don't burn um, methane to heat the building or to um, heat water for the building. And this technology is now mainstream. It's uh, called a heat pump. You probably have one um, in your house. So this is an opportunity for the university, especially in light of the, the large um, capital campaign that may just have been approved. Um, and rather than do this, the findings from our work is that rather than do this as a special program, the way to do it is building by building, project by project, and it would be directing the University Facilities Department to have these standards in mind. And there are two I'll mention, the 2030 standard or the FIAS standard. You may have before you a PDF that shows two, two projects. So this is building, what I'm talking about is in many ways building what, on what the university is doing already. At the top of the PDF, hoping you have this, is a picture of a straw bale house, uh, which was a straw bale building. Uh, built on the University campus. There's one at the uh, University of Michigan Biological Station, one at Mathai Botanical Gardens. Our office designed them both. They are currently the greenest building on campus, I'm told. So what I'm proposing is to um, scale that up and do projects like the one on the bottom half of the page, which is the Keller Center at the University of Chicago. A recent project we just finished, deep energy retrofit, 47% reduction in energy use and other amazing benefits as well. So on a project by project basis, the new technologies and innovative and computer modeling that we can do allow these outcomes to happen. So um, the reasons to do it, it's the only way to meet the president's vision. Students want it um, and it's helping with recruitment. And finally, I'll say we were consultants with the city of Ann Arbor on the recent decarbonization plan and so there's crosstown leadership, and then I think it'd be great if Ann Arbor and the university got together and uh, united their forces and made this, made this a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farr. And we did share your, I did share to all the regents, the president and the executive officers, your, your handout, your latest version. So they, they saw what you have, or it will. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Simeon Newman. The University of Michigan prides itself on accurate and advanced research and on improving the world. But in their response to the COVID crisis, UM administrators have provided zero concrete evidence to demonstrate that they have no choice other than to unilaterally dictate that the most vulnerable will bear the brunt of the COVID crisis. Michigan Medicine announced a raft of layoffs and furloughs slashed retirement matching and has refused to bargain in good faith with physicians and residencies. 
They claim they might be facing a budget shortfall of millions of dollars, but Michigan Medicine recorded a $178 million surplus last year. Does the alleged shortfall take the surplus into account? Does it take the stimulus into account? President Schlissel said UM as a whole faces a budget shortfall of anywhere from $400 million to $1 billion. Why is the estimate so broad? What is included and what is not included? Why haven't top earners reduced their salaries beyond the symbolic pay reduction announced several weeks ago? Why hasn't UM taken the bold measures that the crisis called for to dip into its $12.4 billion endowment? UM administrators have given us empty lies about how the endowment simply cannot be used when much of it is actually unrestricted and donors can be asked to waive conditions even on restricted funds. Why hasn't UM tapped the $1 billion credit line unanimously approved at last Regents meeting? The line was to be used, quote, in the event of a financial emergency, end quote, with UM administrators telling us that we may be $1 billion in the hole, this seems to be an emergency. Or have UM administrators been misleading us about UM finances? It is time to open the book. President Schlissel stated that UM will, quote, share information with as much transparency and as quickly as we can, end quote. But UM administrators have yet to share any meaningful information about the university's real financial situation. Graduate students, lecturers, nurses, house officers, residents, custodial workers, undergraduate workers, faculty, and more stand united in demanding that university administrators live up to UM's commitment to put people first and foster an inclusive and sustainable community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Timothy uh, Jokovic. Good evening. My name is Tim Yugovich. I am a second year PhD graduate student in chemistry on the Ann Arbor campus. Additionally, I serve as a geo steward and a Rackham student government rec representative. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of myself and the concerns of my fellow students whom I serve. I and we are increasingly concerned about the cost of college in the time of COVID-19. Rackham Student Government measured a 600% increase in concern over college affordability between March, March and April of this year alone. While last year the board approved the smallest increase in in-state tuition in the past six years, when combined with substantial increases to out-of-state tuition, fees, and housing, many students saw a cost increase of more than $3,000 a year. In a time of double digit unemployment, the affordability of college has increasingly become the barrier to access of higher education. Freezing all cost increases to students in 2020 will help address this. Other major universities, Michigan State University and Central Michigan University in our state alone have already announced or acted to freeze cost increases months ago, ensuring education remains accessible during this pandemic. While such freezes would likely represent approximately $50 million of potential income, even with them, the university will likely receive more than $1.5 billion next year in combined tuition, housing, and fees. Thus, such savings are a massive boon to the students most at risk and barely a drop to the finances of the university. If the board acts to increase costs to students in this moment of crisis, it is an admission that the University of Michigan is more interested in the pecuniary than the pedagogical. I ask you to care about students in this time of crisis. I beg you to ensure our current and future financial security in this time of crisis. I implore you to freeze cost increases to students in this coming year. I know you will make the right decision for all Wolverines. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I think I Regent Illich may want to make a comment. Regent Illich? Yes, I do. Thank you, President Schlissel. I first want to congratulate the 2020 
graduates, and I'm so sorry we haven't been able to have the wonderful commencements that we do. I wanna thank many of the speakers as usual and typical. Our U of M students are so smart. And to Timothy, I agree very much and support what you have said. We have had robust conversations around, around this, including uh, you know as early as today. And thank you for your comments. I am in full support. Thank you. Okay, uh, that was Mr. Allen who spoke. Is that correct? I believe it was. Um, our next speaker then is Mitchell Dobson Green. I think you've skipped uh, Mr. Allen. Oh, I apologize. I, yeah, I, called him. I sorry, yeah. threw me off. Thank you. So to I'm number sorry. twelve. Yeah. Sorry, go back, uh, moderator. Thank you uh, to Mr. Allen. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the regents for allowing me to speak today about climate change in the University of Michigan. I'm the chair of the Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences Department. Leaders and best. As a kid growing up in Michigan, I heard a lot about this, but thought about it very little. As a graduate student in Michigan, I lived in the lab and didn't think about it either. But when I was asked to consider coming back to Michigan to lead the number one ranked nuclear engineering program in the world, it was the reason I said yes. Clean energy is important. Lives are enriched and opportunity is gained through energy access. As our lives are enriched, we demand energy become less expensive, more resilient, more clean, and that the positive and negative effects of energy use are equitably distributed. This doesn't look the same for every community. We're now at an important inflection point in history where our need for cleaner energy is amplified because of the effects of global warming. The moment we are in is, in, we are in is unique. The COVID pandemic has taught us many things. We can surprisingly work remotely quite effectively. We can communicate communicate across the world more effectively than we imagined. And as a side note, the world wants to talk to us a lot. Our workspaces need to look different to keep us safe. We're in a great pause. The pandemic is forcing us to rethink a lot. Let's use this pause to turn our pathway to one where we are the leaders in best in moving towards cleaner, resilient, affordable, and equitable energy. We can choose institutional policies that minimize our carbon usage. We can use the strength of our faculty and our institutions to help the state, national, and international communities move on their chosen fastest path to zero carbon. History will see 2020 as an important pivot year. Let's not miss the opportunity to pivot hard towards clean energy. Let's be the leaders in best. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Mitchell Dobson Green. Thank you, Madam Vice President. And to the entire Board of Regents, I would also like to say thank you for hearing me on some of the issues facing my fellow U of M colleagues in Dearborn. And I wish you all a safe Memorial Day in advance. Last year, the representatives of the Dearborn student body passed a resolution supporting the One University Coalition and its objectives. I'm here today as the University of Michigan Dearborn student body president, and I intend to continue that support. As I'm sure the board is aware, the One University Coalition has proposed a number of solutions to pervasive issues across our campuses. Solutions which have come from years of information gathering and engagement with students, faculty, and staff from all three University of Michigan campuses. Solutions to issues such as declining enrollment, low graduation rates, lack of representation from marginalized students, and repeated cuts to programs that make our campuses, my campus, unable to fulfill its mission. Solutions such as the Go Blue Guarantee, which can provide life-changing financial relief to the students who need it most. DEI data collecting, which could significantly improve student retention. Expanded scholarships for study abroad, because research shows that students who study abroad are more likely to graduate and have higher GPAs than their peers. And medical and legal services to all University of Michigan campuses because mitigating external conflicts in the legal and health sectors can give our students, my colleagues, the peace of mind that they need to succeed in their academic careers. I am here speaking to you now as a 24-year-old man who will be completing his undergraduate years just before the age of 25. Despite coming from a working middle-class family, I found myself taking a two-year hiatus between my sophomore and junior years due to financial instability and other more personal reasons. But I am not alone. 
it is estimated that 15% of all Dearborn students are non-traditional students. And that is not including our estimated 40% first generation income rate, which is just a part of a larger group of underrepresented students who are among the most at risk of experiencing what I did with the potential to not return at all. We all need the Go Blue Guarantee, expanded DEI efforts, community engagement, learning, more students studying abroad, medical and legal services, and not just at Ann Arbor. Mahatma Gandhi is quoted as saying, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members, end quote. Among the most vulnerable beyond those already mentioned are students of color and the LGBTQ plus community at U of M Dearborn who have not had the support of multicultural or LGBTQ plus coordinators for over a year. At this moment, the students who need these programs most are those most vulnerable members of society. These decisions will be how you and I are remembered when society looks back to this time. These moments are how we will be remembered. Knowing this, I look forward to speaking with all of you more in the future and hearing how the board plans to move forward with these proposed solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Paul Brown has a comment to make. Yeah, thank, thank you. I want to say a few words about our uh, Flint and Dearborn and, as, as President Schussel said, family. Um, the current crisis, uh, albeit scary, it does create a unique opportunity to invest in all of our campuses, but particularly Flint and Dearborn, um, so we can take advantages of the changes in the markets, especially vis-a-vis -vis our competition. Um, we're incredibly fortunate to have our current chancellors at Flint and Dearborn, and I totally support their long-term plans. Um, that said, I, I know we can and, and should do more. Uh, frankly, the most aggressive, entrepreneurial, and well-researched and supported ideas I've been presented with um, have come from the 1U group, and I'm completely in favor of uh, their premise that we need to use resources from outside their siloed budgets uh, to, make, to make these investments. Um, lastly, I want to say a few words um, about the physician's assistance at the University of Michigan. Uh, again, thank you for risking your life every day for the people of, of Michigan, and congratulations for reaching uh, well over 50% of your colleagues' support for the creation of, of a union. Um, I've been a union member uh, for much of my working life and have benefited from it greatly. Um, and now that you've asked for recognition, I look forward to recognizing your group and, and working with you to guarantee a, a fair contract. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Youngkun Chow. Hi, uh, I'm Youngkun Choi. Uh, I'm a doctoral candidate and a graduate student instructor. Uh, regarding the governance uh, amid COVID-19 crisis, the U, U of M president Shuri Sayer stated that the university would, quote, share information with as much transparency as quickly as we can, unquote. I'm here as a graduate student instructor to ask you to fulfill your promise of transparency of information. On top of the transparency of information, I ask a transparent governance shared with all workers in the university. We, the workers of the university, are asked to share some degree of sacrifice. I argue that shared sacrifice requires shared governance. Recently, GEO, a graduate employee organization, COVID-19 CACOS, has asked transparency of information and governance by sending an email with 1,800 signatories to the president, regent, and other leaders of the university. But we did not hear any meaningful answer except a pro forma response. I ask you all, again, to consider our demand for transparent and democratic decision-making seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker of the afternoon is Mitch Deans. Uh, hello, my name is Mitch Deans. Um, I am a Master of Architecture student at uh, Ann Arbor. And as a member of the Taubman College Student Group Coalition, I am speaking to you all today to represent the students of Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning and their concerns regarding the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this unprecedented time, we experienced a sudden shift to online teaching, which severely disrupted our work and reduced the quality of our education outcomes. Though we approved and we 
continue to strongly approve of the university's quick actions to protect the health of its students and staff. The impact was especially severe on design students who rely upon fabrication facilities and design studio spaces to do their work. This negatively impacted the quality of students' thesis work and final projects. Many students who are relying on summer internships and entry-level positions after their studies in the winter semester have seen their opportunities vanish. We are experiencing unprecedented levels of precarity that could threaten our ability to afford to return in the fall semester without signing ourselves over to decades of debt, and many students are questioning whether to return. We are now facing the loss of many valued lecturers and possibly faculty in Taubman College, which will surely lead to further loss in educational quality and a reduction in the world-class education the university boasts of offering its students. This could mean many more students may be deferring or taking a leave of absence for the fall semester. And it's for these reasons that we second the ask of the GOUM grad student COVID letter to one, provide an additional year of funding to all doctoral students and extend all degree milestones by one year, including spring and summer terms. Two, ensure the inclusion of international grad graduate students in this aid, and especially to remove the discriminatory $500 per semester international student fee. Three, fulfill the university's contract contractual obligation to protect the health and safety of students and GSIs. Four, support students in transitioning to remote work. Five, expand allowable uses of the child care subsidy for working parents and those with dependents. And six, to support students in university housing. We also ask that the university prorate tuition and fees for the winter 2020 semester and reduce tuition costs for the fall 2020 semester in a, to account for any transactions to online teaching. We also ask, as other commenters have stated, for the, for the U of M to open the books. President Schlissel, said that UM as a whole faces a budget shortfall of anywhere from $400 million to $1 billion. Why is the estimate so broad? Why has the administration made only symbolic pay reductions to top executive salaries while insisting that the most vulnerable will have to sacrifice? Why has U of M taken the bold measures that the crisis calls for to dip into its $12.4 billion endowment as the UM Professional Nurses Council, House Officers Association, and United Physician, Physician Assistants of Michigan Medicine called for on May 7th? And why has the university not tapped the $1 billion credit line approved at the last Re Regents meeting instead of resorting to firing workers? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Yes, I believe uh, Jordan Acker. Jordan, did you still want to make a comment? I've lost I lost track. I did. Thank you, uh, President Schussel. I'll be real brief today. Uh, I just wanted to, first of all, uh, congratulate all of our graduates uh, on their graduation. Wish we could have done it in person. Unfortunately, we'll, we'll get to celebrate you soon. Uh, what I wanted to just make a quick comment on is, as you know, uh, this meeting is available online, uh, on YouTube. You can uh, ha not be in the room and actually see our Regent meeting. Um, I think this is an incredible step for transparency. And I think that as we move forward, even when we're back together, uh, we should continue to have this option to be able to watch uh, our meetings live and would implore my colleagues to uh, continue to allow that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank all the speakers and all the important topics that they put on the table today. Uh, I wish everybody continued uh, good health, uh, a safe uh, Memorial Day weekend, and go blue. The meeting's adjourned.